We're looking this morning at Proverbs 27. We're looking at the seventh verse, but before we even uh, really turn to the scripture, I've got to turn back to my childhood. When I was a uh, when I was small, when I was young, we spent a lot of time with my grandmother. Uh, my grandma was basically bedridden in a lot of ways. She had been in an accident when my mom was nine years old. Uh, the accident took my grandpa's life, and grandma had to learn to walk all over again after that. But she was never really, she never really got back fully to normal. So even in her, in her 70s, uh, myself and my brother at five and six, seven years old, we would stay with her at night. And our job was just to do whatever she needed, to get whatever, you know, she needed. Well, she would get up in the morning, and sometimes she would, you know, have some fruit for breakfast. And there was this one fruit that she liked. And I, I would watch her eat the fruit, and I would think to myself, you know, I mean, it's, it's perfectly orange on the outside, nice big, I mean, a, a massive orange. And then when she would cut into that thing, it was, it was just a deep red on the inside. And I would think to myself, those have got to be the best oranges that God ever made. So one day, I, I convinced her to let me try it. I mean, this thing is not, even, it's not even called an orange. This thing is so special, it's called a grapefruit, right? So I convinced her to let me try a little bite of her grapefruit. And, you know, I'm, I'm expecting it to be like an orange, like a tangerine, you know, only bigger and better. And I, and I bite in, and, and that first bite in, fireworks literally went off in my head. Uh, my, my face turned inside outward because there was something wrong with this orange. I mean, it was so awful, so bitter. I'm thinking, how can, uh, yeah, now I get it. This is why she gave me a bite of this one and not all the ones before then. I took a, a big, deep bite. My, my face turned inside out. And, of course, I, I, I'm thinking, this orange is rotten. And then come to find out, this is the way all of these things, these things called grapefruits, this is the way they all taste. And, of course, my thought is, how can anybody in their right mind, you know, eat that stuff? People will tell you sometimes grapefruit is good for you. It'll help you lose weight. Well, I, you know, I think it probably will because after you've eaten that stuff, you don't ever want to touch any food again. Like, <laughs> it will help you lose some weight. To some people, though, and there might be, is there anybody here this morning that you really like grapefruit? There's a few, oh, there are a few people here that actually really likes grapefruit. Well, in a little bit, we're going to give an altar call. And when we give that altar call, that's the time for you to respond because something's wrong. Um, I will say this, though. To some people, you, my grandmother included, to some people, even sour things can be sweet. And I emphasize the word some because there is a precondition that really has to be met to make that possible. Looking at one verse this morning, Proverbs 27, uh, verse number 7, the wise king is speaking, and this is what he says. A satisfied soul loads the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul, I almost said a hangry soul, to, every, uh, to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Now, there's two angles from which you can look at this proverb. There's obviously a natural application to this. One way of understanding this proverb is maybe you could say the man who has everything often appreciates nothing, but the man who has nothing often appreciates everything. The man who has any delicacy he desires at his fingertips, the man who's already full, will view even honey as disposable. He will even view the honeycomb as something just to be passed over and passed by. However, to the man who's hungry, you think about the man who has been wandering through the wilderness, no water, no food. He comes wandering out of the wilderness. His, his stomach is gnawing at him. It's growling. To that man, even bitter things like grapefruit are, are a, a sweet and a welcome treat. So there is the natural application. The man who has everything often appreciates nothing, but the, the man who has nothing often appreciates everything. But I don't think that's really the main point here. There's a spiritual interpretation to this as well. I believe that the spiritual interpretation is actually the intent of the author. And when you're looking at Scripture, it really doesn't matter so much what I think about it. What we want to find out is what did the author mean, right? When the author was writing this, what was he trying to say? My opinions about it don't, do not matter as much as what was said because what was said was inspired, was breathed out by the Holy Spirit of God. So this is literally God's Word. I believe the spiritual interpretation, the intent of the author, is uh, the, the wise man, he's primarily referring here to the soul, not to the stomach. He's referring to the spiritual, not the natural. The soul, of course, simply put, is the inner man. It's that spiritual, that eternal part of us. 
So notice the wise man says to the hungry inner man, to the hungry soul, even bitter things are sweet. The interpretation, I think, of what the wise man is saying here is the soul that is hungry will be grateful even if the bites are bitter. The satisfied soul is the soul that has no realization of its need. It's the soul that can pass by the sweet things of God. It can feel no draw because it's already full of the delicacies of the world. The full, the satisfied soul is the soul that can pass by the the buffet of God and not even be drawn to it because they're so full already. The hungry soul, however, it's the soul that growls for God. It's the soul that, that craves Christ, that craves the coming of His kingdom. You remember Jesus actually said, the man that hungers, the man that thirsts after righteousness, Jesus said, that man will be filled. The man that is, think about this, the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the man that is famished for the things of God will have his fill. If you are hungry for God, God, you will have. However, though, if I can take some liberty with the text, nowhere does Jesus indicate how that food is going to initially taste. Jesus says if you're hungry and you're thirsty after righteousness, you will be filled. But Jesus doesn't say it's necessarily going to be good to you at first. I can guarantee you from Scripture first, and that is the most important, but I can guarantee you from experience second that sometimes the feeling that we receive from God will be accompanied, uh, it will be come through things that we would rather not eat. Growing up, or maybe even now, as your parents or grandparents or whoever placed something on the table before you, and, and, and on the one hand you're thinking, man, I'm thankful that I've got something to eat, but on the other hand you're thinking, but I wish it wasn't that. You know that kind of that attitude? The, the reality is there's things that are placed before us sometimes, and they're just not all that desirable. They're not our favorite food. They're not a, that attractive. But I can even take it a step further. There's some things that are placed in front of us on the table that, quite honestly, we just don't even like it. I can't even think about stomaching that. Sometimes, because God loves his children, God will place bitter bites on the table. When my mother, you know, growing up when my mom would give me cough syrup, I can't remember what that stuff was called, but, but when she would give me that cough syrup, it was like the worst experience of life to have to take that tablespoon, put it in your mouth. You, you just think you're dying, or at least you wish you had of before you took that. When she would give me that cough syrup, it was never something I wanted, but obviously it was always something that I needed. The old saying is, if it's good for you, it ought to be good to you. Well, that isn't always true, is it? Right, But the reality is, taste can change. How many of you here, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you here have more mature taste now than you did as a child? In fact, how many of you now, if you have to drink that cough syrup, it's really just not that big a deal, is it? But as a child, man, it was the end of the world. Now, I'm a little older, I tolerate, I can even appreciate things that I didn't, things I couldn't as a child. Those things that were good for me then are actually often good to me now. Like, I would rather have greens. Now, of course, when I say I'd rather have greens, I don't mean a salad. I mean, like, greens soaked in bacon grease. But still, I'd rather have greens now than candy, okay? When put in the right perspective, when accompanied by a righteous hunger, the things we once despise can become things that we actually delight in. To the hungry soul, every bitter thing can be sweet, but only when it is viewed as a gift from God meant to draw us to himself and to prepare us for eternity. The old saying is, what do you do when life gives you lemons? I want to ask you this morning, what do you do when God gives you grapefruit? There are three realities about grapefruit that I want to use, if if I can, to offer you some perspective on the bitter bites that God places on the table. And let me just say, before we even go into these three things, let me say, some people would say, God, you know, I've heard it said, God has nothing to do when anything bad happens in your life, when anything hard comes your way. God didn't have anything to do with that. My friend, that is a complete, complete misunderstanding of who God is and how sovereign God is, how in control God is. You remember when uh, the devil, when Satan came before God about Job, and God said, have you considered my servant Job? The devil could not reach out, even when the devil is involved. The devil is God's devil. The devil could not reach out and do anything to Job without God's permission. So whether it's God himself doing it or at least allowing it, there is nothing that comes into our life that does not come from the sovereign hands of God. So what do we do then? How, how do we respond when God puts grapefruit on the table? I want to give you some perspective 
on the bitter bites that God places on the table. Number one this morning. Number one, I want to show you if it's there. <laughs> number one, the bitter taste is determined by disposition. There are two things, when we think about grapefruit, there are two things that affect the way we interpret how something tastes. And you might, I didn't know this till this week. There are two things, one of them I knew, one of them I didn't. Genetics and conditioning actually determine how you taste things. Now, it may surprise you, but everything doesn't taste the same to everyone. This is why you can think something is the greatest meal ever. It's so delicious, and somebody else is like, I really don't care for that. Things actually don't taste the same to everyone. There's a lot of variability in the human palate. You know, why do some people, think about it this way, Gregory, why do some people like coffee while others are content to live in sin? Like it doesn't, you know, some people like coffee, those that don't, they're living in sin. Why is that? <laughs> the answer is actually genetic. Our biological makeup has more to do with how we interpret taste, especially in regard to bitterness, than we may first realize. For instance, the bitterness of a grapefruit depends on the taste receptors on your tongue just as much as it does the grapefruit itself. Uh, that makes sense, of course, but our, our, taste receptor, our taste receptors are programmed, if you will, by our genetic code. So your family history, your DNA, is going to make a difference in how you taste something as compared to how somebody else tastes something. That's why the, the same dish can be delicious to one person and absolutely devastating to another person. That's why my grandmother could eat grapefruit and love it, and I can eat grapefruit and be crying out uh, like the prophet in the Old Testament, oh, I just wish you'd let me die. To one, it's the light. To the other, it's a, if it's a devastation. Now, I don't want to go into great detail here. I'll just stop it saying the way you inter interpret the taste of something has every bit as much to do with you as it does the thing itself. So there's genetics, then there's conditioning. We like what, what we have been trained to like. You like, and men, you know better than to say this, you like the way mama cooked it, right? Don't say it. Don't admit it. Don't even say amen right now if you're married. But you like it the way that mama did it. Lindsay grew up on, on sweet, like green beans with sugar in them. I grew up on, you know, pork-soaked bacon, bacon grease green beans, right? So when you put those green beans in the refrigerator, when you bring them back out, there's a layer of grease that thick on the top, and that is, that honors God, right? God is in that. <laughs> so Lindsay likes the sweet green beans. I like the bacon green beans. The good thing is I'm usually the one controlling the pot, so it usually turns out my way, <laughs> What we know has a lot to do with what we like. Now think of this in context of cultural cuisine. I like Indian food. A lot of people do not like Indian food. Now I don't like it spicy for two reasons. One, I like to be able to taste my food. And number two, if something gets like barely spicy, I'm a wimp when it comes to this stuff, I'll just start pouring sweat. Um, so I, I like to be able to taste the food. I like Indian food. A lot of American people do not like Indian food though. And why? We weren't raised on that. It's a completely different aesthetic. It's completely different. It's cultural. We enjoy what we're used to. Conditioning makes a big difference. Okay, now you're thinking, okay, now, Pastor, I know that at some point you're going to bring this to something spiritual. And I'm going to be like, no, that was actually, I just want to talk about that ham green beans are better <laughs> than sugar green beans. But conditioning makes a difference. What's the spiritual? If our disposition determines our desires regarding food, then wouldn't it also make sense that our disposition will determine our desires, how we taste the things of God? The way we interpret the taste of what God gives us is based on our disposition towards God. In other words, what is in us will determine how we taste what's placed before us. This is, this is especially true in the spiritual realm. Think about this genetically. All the workings of God are sweet because they are from God. However, they're not always interpreted that way because we were born in a, with a spiritual case of dyscalgia. Dyscalgia is a, is a rare disease, a, a rare ailment that actually distorts the taste of food. So no matter what you're eating, it, it, can taste, it can taste like metal, it can taste bitter, it can taste sweet. Some people who have dyscalgia, no matter if they're eating chocolate cake, it still tastes bitter to them. It still tastes awful. The thing is, God, everything God does is good. Everything God gives is good. But to a man who, who is still in sin, to a man who hasn't been converted, genetically, he's got a case of dyscalgia, if you will, spiritually, and everything God does tastes bad. The birth defect, because of that birth defect, even God's act of grace, even God's active grace in our life is a bitter, a bitter thing, and it leaves a bad aftertaste. 
This genetic mutation in the spirit, in the soul, has rendered us completely unable to savor the things of God. So genetics makes a difference, but so does conditioning. Even if our genetic mutation is addressed, there remains in us taste preferences that we've developed through a lifetime of experience. Can you, you can admit, look, somebody else likes it different than I do, but this is just the way I like it because this is what I'm used to. Those things are kind of programmed into us. And, and initially in life, we're born in sin, even if we become a believer, even if we are given a new birth in Christ, even if, if we have been literally remade by God, those old things are still in us, and we have been programmed to crave the wrong things all our lives. So even when God sets his good things before us, there's something in us that still rebels against it. Both of these things, whether it's genetics or it's conditioning, both of these things have to change if we're ever going to be able to taste the sweetness of God's bitter things. The only true cure for a genetic ailment, you know that nothing can be done for something that's genetic. The only true cure for a genetic ailment is to be reborn. In the physical, that can't happen. That's why Nicodemus, when Jesus said, you've got to be born again, Nicodemus is like, say what? I mean, you saying I've got to enter into my mother's womb a second time and come out again? Of course, that's not what Jesus was talking about. He was saying, Nicodemus, you're in sin, and unless you're born a second time, unless you're given a new birth by God, you can't even see the kingdom of God. The only cure for spiritual genetics is a rebirth. Treatment is not enough. Until we are born again, the things of God will always have a bitter aftertaste to us. That's why people who don't know God say, well, who is God? Or, or they get really aggravated when we say, God has said this is the way life is to be lived. Right? When, when, when we, we would say, God says that, that homosexual activity is out of bounds. God calls that an abomination. And some people would say, well, who are you? Or, or even who is God to say that I can't act on my natural desires? This is, this is the way I feel. This is who I am. Who are you to say it's wrong? You see, the things of God, the sweet things of God, the reality is, with take homosexuality for instance, God, one of the things God is doing is he is protecting us from the things that sexual, sexual perversion does to our own bodies. But see, somebody who doesn't know God, they taste that and they, they spit it out and they say, man, that's bitter. Why? Because genetically they're messed up. The only way to be changed is for God himself to come and to give you a new birth, to change you, to start over. Without a new birth, we will only taste the sour and we'll never enjoy the sweet. We'll only see God saying don't, not God saying, but you can do all of this. The reality is, though, no, and you know this, you're thinking, well, I mean, I'm kind of hopeless now because I can't change the way I was born. The thing is, you can't change your genetics, but Jesus can. Even after we have encountered, though, the genetically altering grace of God, even after we have been born again, there are still things from our old life that are very strong in us, they're very real to us, there are things that we have been conditioned to that God has to work out of us. Again, the way we grew up makes a difference. Part of the working of God's grace is to change our taste. God has to give us new desires, new cravings. He has to teach us to interpret and to enjoy mature taste. Again, there's things that I enjoy now that as a child I was forced to eat. But I'm a little more mature now. My tastes have matured and I can enjoy those things. It's the same way in the spiritual life. Things that used to be bitter to us as we come into Christ, as our life has changed, there is still a process of maturing where we have to learn to enjoy some of the bitter bites that God places in front of us, where maybe before we didn't have, have the chance or the ability. We are shaped by our experience of grace. We should be shaped by our experience of grace rather than our experience of life. And this is where so many get off. They let their life experience shape them rather than God's grace shaping the way they interpret their life experience. This transformation, as, as God transforms us, as he changes our tastes, as he matures us, it leads us to a longing for his kingdom to come both on earth and in us. Our change in desire leads to a change in disposition. Now, I said the way we taste things based, is based on our disposition towards God. As God begins to change us, as we begin to desire the things that God desires, suddenly, rather than with being with our backs turned towards God, saying, that's awful, that tastes terrible, I can't stand it, suddenly we find ourselves facing God, saying, I just want what God wants. 
That changing work that God does, he changes our disposition. And when our disposition is changed, both genetically and experientially, when our disposition is changed, suddenly the bitter things that God puts before us, we realize they're not all that bitter at all. In fact, they're sweet because they're coming from God. God has given us a new hunger for for new things. Things that used to be bitter are now sweet, not because things have changed, but because we've changed The old buffet of sin, it doesn't satisfy us anymore. In fact, now I go to the old buffet of sin, and every time I leave, I leave with a bad taste in my mouth. I can't believe I did that. This new hunger, though, the old buffet can't satisfy us anymore. The new hunger can now only be satisfied with new things. Hungry is actually the hinge on which the proverb swings. It's only to the hungry soul that bitter things are sweet. The hungry soul is the soul that finds sour sweet. And and it finds it sweet precisely because it is hunger. It's this new hunger that God has birthed in me that now, even if God gives me something that tastes terrible, I can enjoy it. I can find a sweetness in it because I know it's coming from the hand of a God who cares more deeply about me than I even care about myself. The heart that longs for the touch of God will find it wonderful even if it's painful. It'll find it sweet even if it's sour. You see, our disposition towards God will determine how we taste the gifts of grace. Now there's a second and third thing, and I'll move much quicker through those. Number two, I want you to see this morning. So first of all, we've looked at uh, the bitter taste. We've looked at that the taste is, is changed by disposition. But number two, I want you to see that the bitter taste is altered by time. The old saying, time makes a difference, is true. The taste of a grapefruit is not only determined by the tongue of the recipient, it's also determined by the time it was picked. When grapefruits are harvested too early in order to get them to the market on time, uh, they don't have time to fully mature, and because they're not fully mature, they'll be even more bitter. Everyone knows the more mature the fruit, the sweeter the juice. If grapefruit is picked before it's ripe, it'll even be more bitter than normal. But if it's given time after it's picked, if it's given time on the table to ripen, it can actually sweeten significantly. Again, in the spiritual realm, the problem is not in God's gifts. The problem is in our perspective. The meal is good. It just needs time to mature. What I'm driving at is this. There are things that are bitter to you now that you will understand are better for you later. May I put it this way? Time tells the whole story. If if I can, I'm going to look at Gregory's life for a moment. Gregory preached last week. He told us his story. He told us about some of the rough things he's been through. And as I was sitting there listening, I saw in Gregory's story the sweetness of God's sweat separation and the sweetness of God's preparation. But I guarantee you, if you ask Gregory, when it was happening, it was bitter. I think about when Gregory was in the hospital by himself. He is separated from friends and family. He seems alone. But in that time of separation, God wasn't separating Gregory from friends and family. God was separating Gregory to himself. But at the time, it probably tasted awful. In the same way, I think about the sweetness of God's preparation. So in, in, in Gregory's life, life was rough. Life was hard. Where he lived was bad. The way life was carried out there was bad. But now I watch Gregory. He's going back into those same kind of neighborhoods. He, he's, he's reaching out to the kind of people that are living the kind of life he used to live. At the time, Gregory, did it taste awful? Yes. But now do you see the sweetness in it? Yeah. So time really does tell the whole story. When allowed to mature, when you let it sit on the table and ripen for a little bit, even the bitter thing can be sweet. There are some fruits that will never fully mature until they are touched by heaven's atmosphere. You know, there are some, some fruits that you actually don't want to get them out in the air because if you get them out in the air, take, take potatoes. I, I recently sowed my potatoes for this year. Uh, for a while, you want to protect those potatoes from the air because when they come in contact with the air, they're going to start sprouting eyes and they're going to go bad quicker. Some fruits actually mature only when put in the right light or they only mature when they're, when they're in the right atmosphere. There are some fruits that will never fully mature until they are touched by heaven's atmosphere. I mean, there are some things that God does in your life and in my life that I'll never understand until I can see them from the other side, from his point of view. 
And I believe with all my heart that in eternity, things that were bitter to us here, and we think, God, why did you do that? God, why did you let that happen? God, why did you cause that? The things that are bitter to us here, the things that turn our face inside out, the things that we spit out, there will come a day when those bitter things, the most bitter things in our life, actually may may be realized to be the most beautiful things in our life, but it'll only happen when they are able to mature in the light of eternity, on eternity's side. And I want you to see something about this. So, so the, the writer said that to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. This truth is all-inclusive. You'll notice in the text, to the hungry soul, every, all, the whole array of bitter bites, it's all sweet. And you might think, really, everything can, everything can the ter- most terrible thing in my life actually have a sweetness? And the answer to that is yes. But it's only because God can bring, bring meat from the eater. Let me explain that statement. You remember Samson? Samson's walking along, and all of a sudden, he's attacked by a lion. Samson, the strong man, the spirit of God came on him, and, and, and Samson killed the lion. He left the carcass laying there. A while later, he came walking back by, and there's that lion that attacked him. And in that lion's rib cage, in that carcass, some bees have built, have built a, a, a nest. And these bees are flying all around it, and, and Samson reaches down into that carcass, and he pulls honey out of the carcass of that lion that tried to kill him. Then later, Samson, uh, the Philistines are toying with him, and Samson gives them this riddle, and he says, out of the eater came forth meat. What I'm trying to get you to see is this thing was going to kill Samson. This thing was going to destroy Samson. But later on, Samson was eating honey out of the carcass of the thing that tried to destroy him. You, you might be thinking, can you really say that every single thing, every bitter bite is sweet? And I can say yes, because God can bring meat from the eater. Romans eight twenty eight. you know the verse, we know that all things, and the key is all things work together for good to those who love God. There's no qualification on it. God says everything is for your good if you love him, if you're called according to your, his purpose. All things are working together. The whole gambit of your life experience, both the bitter and the sweet, they're both being employed by God to bring you to his intended target. Think about suffering in your life this way. When you release an arrow at a target, when you release an arrow at a target, if there's a wind going either way, it can blow the arrow off target. What suffering does, suffering are are like crosswinds, if you will. There's wind blowing from this side, there's wind blowing from this side, and the pressure from the wind blowing on both sides is actually not blowing the arrow off course, it's what's keeping the arrow on course. The wind in your life that you might think is going to blow you off course might actually be the thing that's keeping you on course. All things work together for good. The crosswinds keep the arrow on course. God is simultaneously working in you and through you in all he does. And you don't even know this, but the ripples of your suffering might flow out to shores that you don't even know exist. Places you'll never go, places you've never been. You see, it's only time that tells the whole story. Cowper said this, and Cowper was a man who struggled with deep depression a man who, if he was alive today, we could probably treat a lot of the problems that he had. But Cowper said, his purposes will ripen fast, unfolding every hour. The bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Do you see, the bitter taste can be altered by time if given time to mature on the table. There's a third and a final thing this morning. And I want to show you that the, the bitter taste is altered by time. Number three, the bitter taste can be tamed. What grandma would always do is she would, I would watch her, she'd take a spoon and she would sprinkle something over the, the, top, of the, over the top of the grapefruit. Now, I, I don't know if she was using sugar or salt. I don't know. The grapefruit lover, though, has two options. If you want to tame the grapefruit's bitterness, if you want to get the, reap the harvest of the good things from the, bra- the grapefruit without having to taste the bitter, how do you do that? Well, you can sprinkle on the, the grapefruit salt or sugar. What salt does is it neutralizes the bitter taste in the grapefruit. Salt converts the grapefruit to a bit of a sweet flavor, but the way it does it, it actually doesn't change the grapefruit. What salt does is it draws the attention of the taste buds away from the bitter to the salty. And when you taste that salty, then it gives time for your taste buds to sense the sweetness. So, so if a, uh, what it basically does is in doing this, it allows the natural sweetness of the fruit to shine through. The bitterness doesn't cover up the sweetness. Sugar, on the other hand, so salt converts it to a sweet taste. Sugar, though, on the other hand, covers the bitterness itself. 
you take a spoonful of sugar and you sprinkle it over the fruit. And I will just say, I'm learning to, I can do it. I, can, I will make sacrifices for love. So I'm learning to eat green beans with sugar in it. It's instead, of, instead of a ham hock, it's not, I, I don't think that I'm going to go to hell for it. I might not go to as nice a place in heaven, but I can do it if, that, if that's what she appreciates. Some of y'all did not get what I just said, but anyway. What, salt, what sugar does is it, 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 it covers the bitterness when a spoonful of sugar is sprinkled over the fruit. When it's allowed a few minutes to soak in, it will sweeten the grapefruit and it will render it somewhat tolerable, if not even desirable. The important reality to notice is this, though. The bitterness of the grapefruit is never actually removed. What happens is the focus of your palate is what's moved. Our text never denies the reality of suffering. It never denies the reality of bitterness, nor does it say that the bitter things will cease to be bitter in this life. Cancer is, is terrible. Health problems hurt. Financial woes burden you down. Fr family problems are painful. Divorce is, is devastating. The death of a loved one is debilitating. The bitter taste is real. Can we acknowledge that? The bitter taste is real. However, the bitterness can be masked or at least balanced by refocusing the palate. What salt and sugar does, it doesn't change the grapefruit. It just, tames, it just changes what you sense. Though the bitterness of the bite never changes, it can be covered, it can be converted. Faith is the sugar that sweetens the sour. Perspective is the salt that diverts the attention from the bitterness and allows the sweet notes to shine through. Confidence, the confidence that God is doing a good thing is what makes the bad things tolerable. Yes, the, the grapefruit itself is still bitter, but knowing that it is good for me and God is nourishing my soul through it and God is making me like Christ through it, those knowledge, that knowledge, that perspective, that faith can make the, the grapefruit, if not tolerable, it can make it even desirable. Again, there is a natural sweetness in grapefruit, but our taste receptors often can't distinguish it without some intervention. It's just it's the way it is in life. Or, or maybe you're like me. I tend to remember the bad things more than I do the good things. Are you that way? Or I tend to remember the sour more than I do the sweet. That's the way it is in life. And when God gives us these things, we tend to see only the bitter side of it, not the sweetness. See, grapefruit is bitter, but grapefruit has a natural sweetness. The problem is we're, we are programmed and we taste the bitterness before we taste the sweetness and then the bitterness covers everything else up it's the same way spiritually but confidence in god perspective that god is doing something those things will bring out the natural sweetness in the work of god the bitter experiences of life there is a natural sweetness in all god does but the bitterness of the experience often makes the the sweetness indistinguishable so a little bit of change in perspective a little bit of change in faith believing that god knows what he's doing can make the grapefruit bearable if not desirable the sweet notes of god's grace and intervention are buried beneath the harsh reality of our experience sometimes uh, let me say that again. The sweet notes of God's grace and God's intervention are buried beneath the harsh reality of experience. But a sprinkling of perspective or a spoonful of faith can cover the bitterness and allow us to enjoy the sweet reality that God is at work even if I don't get it. Again, this is not to say that the bite is not still bitter. However, the bitterness no longer defines or ruins the dish. You see the difference? The grapefruit might still be bitter, but you put a little salt on it, you put a little sugar on it, no longer is it defined by the bitterness, it's defined by the sweetness. The dish isn't ruined with faith and the right perspective. As I close with a man at uh, the former church I pastored, big, strong man, you know, loved to hunt, loved to fish, loved to, to, to you know, just kind of get out and do his thing. Well, before I came there to pastor, something happened, something neurological and they said it was not Parkinson's, but it was a Parkinson's-like syndrome. And this man went from being this big, strong man to a man who couldn't get out of his chair to, to a man who, who trembled all the time. And I'm not talking about like a palsy kind of shake. I'm talking about a man who trembled because his nerves were so out of sort and so tore up inside. 
And he would come to every event at the church, and he would say to me all the time, he would say, Preacher, I would be so involved, I would do so much for the Lord if I just wasn't sick like this. And one day, without even thinking about it, I said, No, you wouldn't. And he just kind of looked at me puzzled, like, Okay, you think you know what I would and wouldn't do? And it just kind of came out of my mouth. And I looked at him, and, and without even thinking about it, I said, It's this thing that you so despise that has made you usable to God. If it wasn't for this, this Parkinson's-like syndrome that you have, you'd be out hunting right now. You'd be out fishing right now. You'd be doing the same things you used to do before God, before God struck you with this and, and changed your life. I was trying to get him to understand the bitter thing is actually not the bitter thing. It's the sweet thing. It's the thing that has made you usable to God. You're sitting here right now praying for me as I preach. You're sitting here giving out candy to the kids uh, during, during Bible school because you have been brought to a point in life where you can't stand up and do your own thing. You see, the bitterness was actually what made the dish delicious. Perspective neutralizes the bitterness. Faith sweetens the sour. Let me read this scripture to you. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 15 through 17, For all things are for your sakes, that grace, having spread through the many, may cause thanksgiving to abound to the glory of God. All the things that Paul personally was suffering, he's saying these things are for your sake so that grace may abound to many and glory may go to God. Then he says this, Therefore we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. So even though the outward man finds this, this little bite that God's given me so bitter, the inner man finds it so sweet because it's coming from God who loves me. He says this, verse 17, 2 Corinthians 4, For our light affliction which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That bitter grapefruit that I ate as a child, the first time I sunk my teeth into it and thought it was the end of my world, <laughs> that bitter grapefruit is what has allowed me to stand here this morning and give you what God's given me. The suffering was light affliction. And the light affliction is for a moment. Look, y'all, I'm 33 now. That happened when I was five, seven years old. That, that happened, you know, 28, 29 years ago. And I can look back at it and I can laugh now. But it was that moment that allowed me to stand in this, this moment. That was light. It was momentary. And it's past. But it was that light and that momentary that worked for me a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. And it's the same with you. That The suffering, the bitter bites, they are momentary, they are temporary, they will pass away, but they will leave behind an exceeding aftertaste of the sweetness of God. They will work in you an eternal weight of glory. So what do you do when God gives you grapefruit? The answer is appreciate it even if you can't initially enjoy it. Apply a sprinkling of perspective, put a spoonful of faith on it, and you may find that the bitterness has a sweetness of its own. Again, the wise man says, a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Will you pray with me? Father, now I pray that you will take your word. Lord, I pray that you will use it to change perspective. Lord, I know I, I'm not looking at everybody else. So let's look at myself. <clears throat> Father, I know I am guilty of misinterpreting the things you give and wanting to spit it out like a baby who doesn't want it. Or just kind of spitting it out of my mouth and thinking it's not good. But Lord, when I think of who you are and what you've done, I, I, I have the realization that everything you put in my mouth is for my good. Lord, I know there are people here this morning who are hurting. There are people in, the, in here this morning that have things in their past, things in their life that they can't reconcile, and they do not know why you put that on the table. Oh, but Lord, I pray today that if nothing else, we might not have the answer to why you did what you did. But Father, I pray that you would help them at least gain some perspective that even though we don't know why you did what you did, that doesn't mean that you didn't have a very good and a very specific reason. Father, give us the perspective and the faith to believe uh, that you're at work and that the, the, the things that taste so awful can even be sweet because we know they came from you and they're for our good. Lord, would you work in this time in the hearts of your people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The praise team is going to sing, and they might ask you to sing along with them. I don't know how they're going to do it, but this is what I want to, as I was praying, I had this thought. 
you ever fed a baby? I guess I'm going to get to do that here soon. You ever fed a baby and uh, strained carrots? Who wants to eat strained carrots? You put that in that baby's mouth, and that baby puts it back out of its mouth, right? It doesn't want anything to do with that. But why do you give it strained carrots? Because you know strained carrots is what that baby needs. Has it ever occurred to you that maybe you're being a baby with God? God takes the little spoon, and he does the little airplane, and he finally gets you to open your mouth, and he sticks that thing in there, and you're like, this is awful. What's he thinking? I'll tell you what he's thinking. He wants you to make it. He wants you to live. And strained carrots is what's necessary for you to grow, for you to move forward, for you to live. Maybe part of the perspective we need to take this morning is that we need to stop being babies. The hungry soul is not a baby soul. The hungry soul is a soul that's grown up and that sees that God is at work. I hunger and I thirst after righteousness, and that hunger and that thirst, even if when God answers it, if the bite is bitter, I am thankful for it because God is satisfying the hunger and the thirst of my soul. And I guarantee you, in, a, in eternity, when we look back, it will be the bitter ingredient that made the whole dish delicious. As we sing, I invite you now. Now it's time to you, for you to respond. Whatever God has said to you through this time, now you have a responsibility to respond back to God. What, what is God saying? How are you going to respond? Again, the only right respond to, response to God is yes. You know, you might be thinking, God's asking too much of me. He's not. Anything that God's at, you might be thinking, well, God's t calling me to give this specific sin up, and I just don't know. That, that's just too much. He's not asking too much of you. He cares about you, and that sin will destroy your soul, not just for now, but for eternity. You might be thinking, you're telling me that I have to be thankful for the worst thing that ever happened in my life. You're saying that's just tragic, that's, that's terrible. But it might be that worst thing is the only reason you're sitting here this morning and not, not out in the world away from God. Yes, I'm asking you to respond to God and saying, God, you knew what you were doing even if I don't. During this time of invitation, I want to stop now. During this time of invitation, you respond to God as God has spoken to you. I'll be happy to meet you at the front if you need somebody to pray with you, but now is your time to do, do business with God.